Settle in class and welcome to Monster Hunting 101. Dragons are powerful and versatile in every place imaginable and most of all indistinguishable to your average farmer. That's a big issue because their powers are incredibly different, though absolutely fascinating. And that's before we even get into different additions and systems. Today we'll be covering what to do if you hear the words red dragon, and I don't mean the species, I mean the color. We'll go over red colored dragons in both D&D and Pathfinder, the main red dragons, what they're all like, and how they bite. Plus four custom dragons are made for both systems, one of which can be used as a familiar. And they also made sure to make conversions for either system if a dragon's only in one. You ready? Let's go! So first of all, we need to figure out if this is a true dragon or a dragon kin. Separating off the true dragon sounds kind of derogatory, but there's plenty of red scaling creatures an average person might mistake for a proper dragon. With red dragons specifically, you're probably talking about pseudo dragons and drinks. Or a dinosaur, I guess, but they're probably native to the area and people already know what they are. When a dragon is young, they're relatively small, but they're still in the size of a person and spend a good century or so at the size of a horse. But most people don't know that, so the sighting of a wormling or tamed hatchling is often a pseudo dragon. Your Pathfinder equivalent would be a house drake, though they tend to lead more purple and blue. They're mostly harmless and easy to reason with, at worst they'll steal your lunch. They're the size of a house cat and they know they aren't the strongest, so despite their pride they often partner with people for mutual benefit. Once the town knows about this, the terrified victims might even find them useful and the party might be able to hire them. They fly fast, have good stealth and senses, they eat mice, and they're great scouts. The D&D version is simple telepathy and a knockout venom that your rogue will love. In Pathfinder they speak three languages and have stupefaction breath. They can also mentally zap and slow people who try to use magic on them. Through level one in Pathfinder as opposed to one quarter in D&D, so a bit stronger. Also, this time I put the conversions in the description and on the screen, which I probably should have thought of sooner. And if you appreciate all these stat blocks I put in my videos, consider that like and subscribe button. Anyway, if they're reporting an actual attack or big traveling companion, they're probably talking about a drink. Now that's a very different word and specifically 5e, so let's go over each. If it's D&D in red, we're talking about a guard drink, basically a cross between a flightless dragon and a guard dog. They're actually created by dragons with rituals using their scales and imprint on the first person who feeds them. They're highly aggressive with the upper end of animal intelligence but they don't breathe fire, just resistance. They also don't have wings, but reds can climb, so don't think you're safe up high. Now, dispatching them is simple. They're only CR2 with a basic bite and tail slap. They're a bit bulky, a bit weak, but also really scary. They have to be created, so someone walking around with these is a symptom of a much bigger problem. Now, for Pathfinder style, we're likely talking about the flame drake. These are your two wings, two legs body plan. What I affectionately call the dragon chicken. They're the size of a horse, they fly, they have a surge of speed to run down anything, and have a fireball breath on a long range charge. They also have a big flurry attack with teeth and tail, but this one talks, so it does have at least decent reasoning. That means it can abuse the fact that it can see through smoke, is immune to fire, and knows to pepper from a range instead of always rushing in. It also means they can negotiate and make simple agreements. They'll only usually bother if it's between drakes over territory, but if raised from an egg, they can make for a dangerous partner. A level 5 creature for a mount is no joke. This also means that despite their hide not being that valuable, there's always a lucrative market for their eggs. Of course, good luck actually getting them, because this is the rare dragon that actually travels in a group. It's called a rampage, and it's usually only a few strong, but they can have up to 12 if there's enough prey to go around. So when you hear there's multiple dragons attacking, it's usually one of these. Thankfully, they do have a few weaknesses. They're decently strong and tough, but everything else is barely low. They also have a major weakness to cold damage and only meddling health. They're glass cannons. Amazing damage, but go down quick if you hit hard on the weak point. These newest additions, Pathfinder 2e and D&D 5e, were basically a divergence point for most things. Pathfinder made theirs more interesting but weaker, and the D&D version got outcompeted by wyverns. They were CR10 with quick reflexes, relying on flyby attacks and degrading weapons. They didn't have fire breath, but their body was so hot they did fire damage to whatever touched them. That's more damage to you when they attack, and damage to your weapon when you do. They could also make three attacks of opportunity and were weak to cone. But for our purposes, the most fun part is how they would actively pretend to be young red dragons to scare people off. Nobody wants to risk messing with an actual red dragon. Speaking of which, it's finally time for the main event. Let's say it's got the breath, the size, the intelligence, the right number of limbs. Four legs, two wings, no beak. Why is beak even a question? There's technically the Kanga motto. It means boat breaker. You find them on rivers and swamps, far from red dragon habitat. But don't get me wrong, they are very dangerous. They have strong attacks with amazing reach and can terrify with their screech. They also have a grab and deal extra damage to objects, so they hit you with high speed strafing runs and smash your boat to bits. The thing is, as far as dragons go, it's a bit of a stretch. I mean, it is a dragon, but we're talking about a pterosaur dragon. One that others might have diverged from, but it never died. It's got that draconic greed over prey and territory, but their magic goes into bolstering their beak, and instead of a breath weapon, they've got that screech. It makes them really distinct. You're not gonna confuse them for a red dragon. Though I guess there is nowhere else I could mention it. Anyway, forget about the dino dragon, let's say we have an actual red dragon. First thing we've got to do is figure out what version. Does it really matter that much? Yeah, the Pathfinder and D&D versions are more different than you think. I mean, looks wise they're not miles off, close enough that any panicking peasant couldn't give you a good enough description. Personality wise, they're pretty similar as well. They're tyrants and overlords, flame based, love destruction, breedy. They're the pinnacles of dragon kind in many ways and keep fireproof hordes of wild splendor. But D&D's version is a lot more boastful. In their culture, it's all about proving you're the best. They fight each other to prove their standing, beat up other dragons, and take over areas to gain more titles and attract 
track mates. When they're awake, they're spending as much time outside their lair as in it, looking for something to prove their strength. They track not just what's in the horde, but the exact value, because it's all about domination, displays of power, etc. They're really smart and about as good as physically possible in most aspects, but it gets them into trouble. It's all a performative and fragile pride, proving their superiority to themselves as much as others. After all, if you can't defend something, you don't deserve to have it, from pride to life, so they're the type most likely to fight to the death. The Pathfinder version, however, doesn't need to prove themselves. They know they're the best. It's unshakable confidence. There's no need to prove the sky is blue. It's observable fact, and if you can't see the obvious, you're not worth the time to explain it. They don't taunt their prey either. They don't speak to lesser creatures. They dominate, control, and destroy. Their minions are kept to endlessly expand and trap their lair, not just to protect their horde, but their often sleeping self as well. While D&D dragons mostly ravage and steal to improve their status or anger over a slight, it's just a pastime for Pathfinder ones. The world belongs to them, and they'll bully, kill, or manipulate as they see fit. Public brutality for intimidation is their favorite type of domination, and their horde isn't to impress someone. It's because they like shiny things and they take what they want. The treasure is also insanely hard to steal. Even once the dragon's dead, the coins it sleeps on are fused together just from their body heat. Like a golden throne for something the size of a house. I get that matters if we're trying to persuade them, but for fighting they're the same, right? They're big with thick scales and wings and fire breath. Their speeds are about the same and they both got prideful presence, right? And the bites and claws and wing slaps and tail slams. Yes, but how they bite and how you should fight them are very different. With D&D, you have legendary resistance to ignore failed saves, combined with bulk and armor to make them very resilient. Adults can move around or snap you with their wings and tails between other people's turns, so they're always laying into you. And if you're in their lair, they can even react to you with clouds of smoke or tremors or searing heat. You'll occasionally find one with a few spells like Dominate or Heat Metal, but they're fairly straightforward. Blast bows with fire and effects while ripping into them with absurd strength and bone. We're talking 30 and 29 out of a possible 30 by the time they hit Ancient. That is quite literally the level of divinity given flesh. They're also really smart. Their only weakness is average dexterity, and the region surrounding their lair warps to hell, becoming so pure rocky desert for miles around with ominous flames the dragons can hear through. It helps with the idea that if you're out in the open in a fair fight, the dragon will always win. Not that it's gonna be a fair fight, because they have no problem with underhanded tactics. On the bright side, while they might do strafing runs with fire against large groups, if you get them in a solid fight, they'll usually stay till the end, especially since you're probably fighting on one of their temper tantrum pillaging sprees. On the other hand, the Pathfinder Red Dragon is also strong with good fortitude and con, but outside that, their stats are middling to low. What they lack in raw numbers, however, they gain in abilities and power. That jaw hits really hard, and they can swap it for a flurry of wings and claws, and having opportunity attacks means a lot as well, both because that's rare in Pathfinder, and because the adult and ancient ones radiate heat to scorch anything near them. When it said they fuse the coins they sleep on, it wasn't just flavor text, so if you don't try to run away, you're still taking damage. And while they do have a 1-4 to four round charge on their breath, if they crit, it immediately recharges. They're also above average on accuracy, and in Pathfinder, anything that hits by 10 or more will automatically crit, so there's a decent chance their draconic momentum will just let them keep blasting. Oh, and good luck hiding in the wreckage, because they can see through smoke. By the time they're ancient, they can control fire, even stealing magical fire or your fire spells. While they've got barely high HP and decent saves, they also have a very strong weakness to cold, so if you know what you're getting into and prepare for the fight, you can really burst them down. And honestly, if you want it gone, you'll probably need it too, because I see nothing about them being inclined to fight to the death. They've also got one more trick up their non-existent sleeves. All of them have some built-in spellcasting for detecting magic and identifying items, and by ancient they learn suggestion and wall of fire, and all of those are at will, and spellcasting in general is pretty common, and they usually turn to utility spells like invisibility, haste, resist energy. As they age up, they turn to things like reverse gravity and wall of force, but their base power is all the offense they need, which means that they're crafty and shore up their shortcomings instead of just using more fire. The only damaging spell that most will ever take is Chill Touch for cold damage. So we outmaneuver the D&D ones, and we hit the Pathfinder ones hard and fast. That's actually a bit more simple than I expected. Not necessarily. Before we get into my special homebrew dragons, which I'm honestly kind of proud of this time, let's walk through a fight at the different ages. For a wormling that isn't still with their mom, you're usually looking at a basic little den, maybe with some kobolds or cultists to boss around. Their fire breath hits hard, but they're actually pretty weak outside it, just well armored. Oddly enough, the red wormlings usually die fighting because they haven't learned fear. That's not really something innate with them. They still aren't stupid though, and against overwhelming odds or obscured senses, they may flee. Your focus should be on cutting off escape routes and bursting it down so it doesn't have a chance to get its breath back. They might not have much in the way of defenses, but a dragon who knows you're coming might scatter sticks and leaves around so their breath creates a barrier of flame, or just ditch their minions to buy time for an escape. And this goes for both systems. I'm putting wormlings back in Pathfinder. I agree that 12 categories was too much, but you gotta have a baby dragon. What if the party takes a dragon egg? Anyway, for young adults, you're facing them in their first real lair. They prefer caves and mountains, but they're still weak enough that it might not be in their ideal location. This is a dragon who has spies looking for threats, cobalt workers trapping and mining, but they're probably threatening towns and tribes for tribute. The locals might still think it can be slain, but the defeat is fresh and some scared villagers might sell you out. Their lairs might look different, with D&D's version being more grandiose, while Pathfinder's a bit more practical, they're still functionally the same. Just remember to think of how the dragon gets in and out. If there's no back entrance, we need our traps to be throwing fire, avoidable with flight, or manually operated by kobolds. A young dragon like this 
Venus is going to be arrogant, ready to stand its ground unless the foe seems overwhelming. Even then, once it grows up, it's gonna come back for revenge. And remember to make sure the entire lair is hazardous. The dragon's horde and resting chamber should be especially dangerous. Minions on balconies shooting down, fire pits to create smoke or fall into. There might be a lieutenant, an aging caretaker trusted enough to have a magic item from their horde. Just remember that if they know you're coming, they aren't stupid. If they can think of a way to escape with their pride, they will. So if you're not sure to win, the safest move is to hit fast and hard. Pathfinder ones might leave if pressed, and D&D ones might let worthy foes live to spread tales of their victory. As they age to adult and ancient, the pattern continues on a grander scale. Now the landly rollover probably won't help the party, because failing to slay it might get them all punished. Now even getting to the dragon is an issue, since they're usually high in the mountains and volcanoes. It might attack you while you're climbing, so thankfully only the stupid ones lead with fire breath. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but they can't take your stuff if it's a mounted puddle. It's also here that we diverge a bit. With D&D dragons, you're looking at lavish lairs full of statues and trophies, hordes of loyal minions, and in a fight, the dragon might begrudgingly flee. At this point, they don't usually bother with specific strategies. They just have a few general ones they figured out years ago with counterplay depending on how you react. This means that if you study their legends, you can get an edge by learning how they like to start battles. Thankfully, while they love complex ambushes and traps, and their network of spies mean they probably know you're coming, if you start to figure them out, they just default to brute force. They like to leave the thinking for their downtime. Battle's time for blood and glory. Though you still need to be on your guard at all times. They will rarely back down if they actually have to fight. While they try to avoid actual threats by making excuses, sometimes they'll just randomly launch themselves as stronger foes for daring to be stronger. Especially the older ones who tend towards megalomania, actually believing their own hype. The Pathfinder ones are similar, but their pride has always been able to withstand a fall. They're far less likely to stay if they're actually in danger, but they will bite you tooth and claw if you get near that horn. The good luck getting to it, they specifically like to choose dangerous spots like volcanoes and cliffs. And while their counterparts minions are making monuments to their greatness, these ones are making traps to guard a dragon who knows they're mortal and guards their weaknesses. You're not gonna get the drop on it. Don't expect to come into this in one piece, and especially not out of it. This is a dragon that knows it's dangerous up close, and will use magic to fence you in or keep up with you. A spellcaster might use haste to blitz you down, the mundane version will try to keep you together since they get more breath weapons, but no matter what happens, you're playing rock attack, so make sure you're armed. Now that's all the standard, but dragons are anything but. Variations exist both on how they're run and what they can do, and they don't just mean simple changes like how old Pathfinder dragons would turn stone into lava with their breath weapons. Simple changes like that you can just add back in, like giving your dragon a burrow speed and making its breath piercing for a scorching sands dragon. Change its breath to a fireball and give it a whirlwind like an air genie and you get one of smoke or steam. But we all know I like to get more in depth than that. This is a fire dragon, but dragons are always embodying forces of nature. So how about we mess with that element? What would happen if it was drained? Perhaps by a curse or maybe a parasite, the heat seeker dragon has lost its internal flame. But nature abhors a vacuum and nothing can fill that void except warmth. This dragon changes based on storing heat. The dragon's attacks and even being near it deals cold damage. But unlike other dragons, this isn't blowing cold onto you. This is sucking the heat out of you, pulling creatures in like a black hole. However, when the dragon deals cold damage, there's a chance it reignites its internal spark. Once it enters heat mode, this dragon works the opposite. Fire damage on all its attacks and it stays this way until it uses its breath weapon. This one is an explosive force, knocking everything away as it ejects all its body heat. I would pair this with a color switch, from pallid and shriveled to a vibrant frenzy. It's suddenly on a high, a rush, it finally feels whole again until the driving need to burn drains them once more. They're a fire dragon, without it they're empty, they're nothing, but they can't truly be themselves without emitting it. If your party finds out about the backstory, they might pity it and try to cure it. And if they don't and try to fight it, that mode switch is sure to be a wicked surprise. So is the fact that they're weak to cold. Nobody expects something to be weak to their own damage. But as for the next one, how about we go back to that burning sand idea? The glass dragon, which at first was going to make stained glass, but how about a mood ring? The glass dragon scales are a million reflective fractals that change color with their mood. Their culture is all about art and theater with complex social etiquette, because they learn incredible stealth by controlling their mood to change color. They also tend to be chaotic neutral drama queens. They aren't aiming for people to be hurt, but they just live to keep things interesting. Their horde, of course, is full of art, collections of plays, and momentums from spectacular blowouts they cause. Their breath weapon is a ball of molten glass, not only dealing fire damage, but leaving difficult terrain. They've got high AC with low HP, since glass is tough but brittle, but if you deal enough damage at once, you'll lower that AC by shattering their armor. The shards do piercing damage to anyone adjacent. It also reveals their true form, semi-solid molten glass whose heat can scorch anyone nearby. They also glow and replace their bludgeoning weakness with cold. While in their lair, your older dragons can summon walls of glass, shine fairy fire spotlights, and either move or heal with glass blowing. And of course, every truly legendary dragon has regional effects. These ones cause phantom spotlights to highlight any argument, makes anyone who lives there want to spread rumors, and can listen from any of the literal wallflowers growing in ivy curtains. So if you don't want to use this complicated sap lock, just put one in the background of your region. Your party has to deal with working in a town full of gossip and rumors from a glass dragon stirring up drama just by existing. Maybe yours is information the party needs for a quest. But in exchange, they want dirt on someone who's been avoiding them. I really didn't realize I like form-shifting dragons so much. Well, to make up for making these so complicated, I also made two simple glass drinks. The larger one's an ambush hunter made of durable borosilicate glass. They're far too heavy to swim, but in water they're effectively invisible. Their breath weapon is glass shards, and their eggs are practically useless. Their meat is toxic, they resist training, and they're basically an invisible dragon gator that holds you in contempt. 
also people get freaked out because the transparent body lets you see their meal digest. They do form rampages, but they mostly just lay around by bridges and throw glass at people who don't feed them. I also made a tiny stained glass one that's weak enough to be a familiar. They're made of stained glass, but completely control their pattern, making them blindingly gorgeous. Uh, that's me being literal, instead of a breath weapon, they focus their scales into a laser. These prissy little things are basically first dogs. They charm rich people into taking them on as guards and pets and accessories. They do demand respect, but they don't actually mind if they're not treated as the most important. They like to think of themselves as puppet masters, pulling the strings and ears of rulers. Therefore, they're the true ruler without any danger. In the wild, they rely on camouflage and mostly feed on sand and bugs, but they do their best to gather companions at all times. Once they find some, they're shockingly loyal, seeing their web of connections as their horde. As long as you treat them right, they pamper their horde right back. They might eventually move up to greater things, but more than one usurper has been slain by a petty glass drake. Now, one more thing I'd like to add, I was gonna make a Hellfire dragon, but I kinda got beaten to it. You see, Pathfinder had four broad categories of dragons, two of them original and two based on D&D, which is why they recently redid their dragons with new ones falling under the four kinds of magic. The fire one is the extremely red diabolic dragon. These are extensions of hell itself, acting with tyrannical cunning and unsettling calm. They've got spells like wall of fire and falling stars, plus their fire breath, but what makes this special is that they can swap any fire damage with unholy spirit damage, basically necrotic damage for your D&D folks. It also hits back with mental might against any melee attack that crits it, but affects any holy creatures harder. I tack this on at the end because it's fine. Don't get me wrong, it's got an interesting gimmick, I just feel like it's the most boring of the new age. And we already had an underworld dragon with the amazing imperial line. They have this gimmick of being weakened or strengthened based on what they're attacked with. It's absolutely brilliant and I can't wait to talk about them, but I digress. I hope you found this new format interesting. I'm still experimenting with how to do my monster series, but I am going to be talking about a lot of monsters. Next up will be green dragons and plants. I'm going to be doing occasional polls over what comes next, so feel free to leave ideas for options. Either way, I can afford to experiment thanks to my lovely copy supporters, Barrel Goblin, Level 1 Cleric, Snake Oil, and Modern Masquerade. Link in the description if you'd like to help me save up for new equipment, and next goal is a microphone. We got a little setback due to a headset break, but we're looking to get one in September. I'm sure it'll be a good sounding upgrade, but honestly this one is 12 years old and held together with glue. I'm more concerned with inevitable failure. Anyway, thanks for watching. Class dismissed.